I am the Director of Applied Technology for uh, the, the Department of Design and Construction. We are a capital delivery agency. Uh, our mission is to uh, design and, and deliver uh, many of the infrastructure and buildings uh, in the city of New York. So we do a lot of correctional facilities, uh, police, libraries, health facilities, um, as well as infrastructure work. So we, we have a very, uh, a very large portfolio in excess of uh, $17 billion. Um, all of our projects are not BIM projects, and I'll talk to you a little bit about how, uh, how our, our projects sort of come to us and how they progress. Uh, the infrastructure client, uh, we mainly represent Department of Transportation uh, and DEP, uh, Department of Environmental Protection Facilities. Um, and the BIM in, in those areas, it, it hasn't been uh, much uh, to date. Um, so, the, and, and I think that's, uh, you know, although I've heard differently, uh, maybe in, in certain parts of uh, this region, uh, mainly mainly Japan, that it's somewhat different where the uh, infrastructure work uh, related to BIM is actually picking up where it's, it's a lot different for us in, the, uh, in, in North America and the U.S., uh, where the buildings and, and the BIM implementation with buildings is, has been uh, trending and progressing for the last decade, and the uh, infrastructure folks, uh, underground utilities, roadways, they've been uh, a little bit more slow to adopt. Uh, to date, uh, the agency was founded in 1996, and to date we've completed uh, 3,728 projects. Um, a very small portion of those have been BIM projects. Uh, we began implementing BIM, uh, I think it was in 2007, and to date we have about uh, 20 to 25 BIM projects under our belt um, in various, various levels of, of implementation. Uh, so why BIM? Um, you know, as an agency, uh, as an agency, uh, you know, we, we, and really as an industry implementing a BIM approach, we definitely saw uh, the benefits in, in the quality of the documentation and improvements uh, in coordination uh, just from the overall BIM implementation approach. Uh, so we were looking for a collaborative solution for design and documentation and coordination. Uh, and um, we're, we're an agency, uh, once again, delivering capital, capital projects. Uh, it's a very large portfolio. Um, and one key aspect of the work we do is uh, we do a lot of building assessments. So we revisit uh, many of our projects over and over. Um, and a part of that work is assessing the uh, sort of current building stock that we have. Uh, and we were looking towards BIM as being a, a sort of central repository of data related to our buildings that we can uh, access over time. Um, some, some other benefits, the 3D component, 4D uh, time, 5D cost. Um, also, uh, an increased understanding of the project and the project workflow. Uh, so because of the way we procure our projects, and it, you know, I'm not, uh, not very versed with, with how you guys procure your projects uh, in this region, but uh, most of our work is uh, a design, bid, build sort of contract uh, where we hire consultants, so we design the work in-house. Uh, the work goes out to bid, uh, and because of all sorts of government mandates and, and laws, uh, we in turn select the lowest qualified bidder uh, to implement the work. <laughs> lowest, you guys laugh, lowest qualified. Uh, and uh, you know, a BIM, a BIM approach, it, it helps, I think, everyone. And it, it brings that level of understanding uh, related to a project um, a little closer to, to this area, where as today, uh, you know, we have our owner who uh, probably goes out and hires the architect. Uh, we have an architect who uh, usually sub, subcontracts some of the design work to engineering professionals. Uh, and the CM, uh, if we get a CM or the GC, uh, they typically don't even come on uh, during this phase of the project. So we have schematic design, design development, uh, construction documents. Um, if we're fortunate to get a CM on board early, uh, 
they, they sort of get a piece of the project, but usually it's you know, after the construction documentation phase. Um, and all of this information is lost to the trades once they, once they uh, get on. Uh, at this point of the project, they're just looking at a set of biddable drawings. Um, all of this discussion uh, is lost on them. So, you know, BIM, uh, BIM and uh, that approach, an integrated project delivery approach, um, even without the, with, without the uh, uh, change in a uh, sort of contract structure, but the more information we can deliver early on, the better we feel it is for the project and the goals of our projects. Uh, also, as an industry, we're, we're uh, BIM. Um, we think it can definitely help us increase our productivity. Um, this is a, a common slide that I've been seeing around for uh, the last five, seven years maybe. It's been recently updated. Um, I think it, before it, it used to go to 2008. Uh, someone, someone's recently updated it to, to 2012. But uh, it, shows, it shows the productivity in uh, construction. Uh, versus all non-farm farm labor. So every other industry uh, has been a lot more productive and has increased their productivity uh, over time, whereas uh, the construction industry we've sort of flatlined uh, over the last few decades. Um, there's been, this dip here probably is uh, in, in North America related to the recession. Uh, in 2008, but you see even before that we were somewhat on an upswing, and it looks like we're back on an upswing again. Um, but the use of building information modeling, the use of this technology, um, hopefully it can increase our productiv productivity as an as a industry uh, and um, you know, help deliver better projects. Uh, so I said uh, as a agency, we began using BIM uh, in 2007. Um, there were some forward-thinking folks at the agency who uh, had some familiarity with BIM and what it was, and they added it to our contracts, right? So someone threw it right into the contract. Uh, these are, uh, and this is the language that they put in. This is, I, I pulled this language right from the contract. Um, the consultant will be required to use a building information modeling program, Revit or similar for the project. That was the language in one contract. All right, so this is 2007. Uh, another contract, someone got a little more savvy and added a little more language. Um, and they referenced, uh, they referenced the building information modeling standard of 2007, uh, the national building information modeling standard in North America. Um, so that was a little better, but it, it uh, wasn't enough, wasn't sufficient. So there was uh, so much gray area in that. Um, I was working for uh, one of the design consultants at the time, and you know, we pretty much told the city of New York, hey, we're, we're delivering BIM to you just like you asked us, and we'll give you whatever it is that we want, and we'll say, hey, this is BIM. We turned over a Revit file, uh, but it had no real value to the city at the time, but it was BIM, and, and we met that contractual obligation. Um, so fast forward to uh, 2012. Uh, in 2012, uh, we developed the agency's BIM guidelines. Uh, the BIM guidelines are also referenced in the contract uh, today. Um, we, uh, in developing of the, the BIM guidelines for the agency, we, we looked at the national BIM standard. There were several other uh, agencies, government agencies, also universities that were putting out pretty uh, decent guidelines. Uh, at the time that we referenced the uh, Veterans Affairs, Army Corps of Engineers, Ohio State, uh, Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, um, and the Indiana University. Uh, so what went into our guidelines? Um, just some key points, uh, and I like to highlight this. The, the guide, it's very software agnostic, so we don't specify a particular uh, software vendor or software application. Um, we uh, are restricted primarily to a design, bid, build sort of framework. Um, but we uh, also recognize that other project delivery models, uh, whether it's an integrated project delivery or uh, a design build contract um, is, is possible. 
uh, although it's not very likely on the work that we do, um, and that a BIM approach would be different in, in those contexts. Um, uh, BIM execution planning is uh, a very large part of what we do and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in managing our BIM projects. Um, where we set goals, we talk about BIM use, level of development, uh, and what the overall requirements are for project and deliverables. Um, so I just threw, threw some, some uh, names up here, but we're all familiar with Autodesk and uh, Bentley and uh, et cetera. Um, the reason, uh, one of the major reasons that uh, the guidelines are software agnostic is that we hire uh, over 20 different design consultants. And uh, for the most part, you know, Autodesk, they, they have, uh, and it, it seems this way uh, in, in this region as well, but in North America, they have one of the largest, uh, the largest market shares. Um, so primarily, most folks are using uh, Revit. Um, but you also have some consultants who use other applications. And we uh, do not necessarily mandate to our consultants what vendor, what application uh, they should use. We're more concerned about the deliverables uh, and how the information that they turn over to DDC uh, can help benefit us and benefit our clients. Um, with that, uh, we'd like to, uh, we've specified over 15 BIM uses in our guidelines. Uh, the BIM use really helps to, uh, it, it helps to sort of give a framework and inform the, de the design consultants what DDC is looking to achieve on a particular project. Uh, so we have existing condition modeling as a use, uh, cost estimation, programming, site analysis, uh, clash detection, uh, most of uh, the industry is very familiar with. Uh, design authoring is, is what our design consultants do on a day-to-day -day basis using a BIM authoring tool, whether it's Revit or uh, Bentley or, or any other uh, application, uh, uh, mostly Revit. Um, <clears throat> and you know, these happen in different phases, uh, the planning and design phase, the construction phase, and the operation phase. Uh, as an agency, we represent over 20 client agencies. Um, some of them I mentioned in the uh, previous slide. Um, we do not operate and maintain their facilities for them. This is another reason that uh, we, we took a sort of software agnostic approach to our guidelines. Um, each client agency, they use different software, different applications, different, uh, different ways of operating and maintaining their buildings. So it's not something as an agency that we do. Uh, what we are interested in is handing over information to our clients that uh, we think would be useful for them now and in the future, and as well as useful for, for ourselves. Uh, many of the work, or much of the work that we do, uh, we uh, end up going back to a facility over and over and over again, uh, over a decade, right? So we'll um, go do a facade replacement and next week, Next year, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll go do a roof replacement. Uh, and you know, a couple years later, we'll replace a boiler. Uh, a lot of the work is very small jobs. Um, but uh, one of the intents as well of our BIM program is that over time, uh, that we'll develop uh, a series of building information models that we'll uh, begin to archive that can um, serve as a uh, existing condition of a facility. Uh, and record models for, for each of the projects that we do. Uh, this information we can share uh, amongst ourselves, share with our design consultants as well. Um, goals, so I talked about goals. Uh, if I jump back real quick, so I, I like to differentiate the difference between uh, BIM use and goals, right? So at the onset of our project, uh, within, uh, I think it's within three weeks, and this is also in our contract, uh, we hire a design consultant. Um, <clears throat> the DDC BIM guidelines that I showed you is a part of their contract. Within, uh, within three weeks of project kickoff, uh, the design consultant submits to DDC a uh, BIM execution plan. Um, we specify the goals and the uses that we're trying to meet. So say we're trying to meet all 15 of these BIM uses. That means you as a consultant, you have to deliver a building information model that is going to uh, achieve this use. So I didn't necessarily specify 
or spell out how we were going to achieve that use. Um, but that's where the BIM execution plan comes in. And that's where we talk about goals for particular projects. So um, depending on the project, the constraints, the client, what we're looking to achieve, uh, we may look to achieve all of these goals, some of them. Um, you, know, if, uh, uh, you know, if it's a pretty straightforward building, uh, maybe coordination is an issue, right? So maybe we don't need uh, clash detection. Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, we might be looking for uh, tighter bids. Um, that's always an a, a issue on our projects. Um, but how can we achieve that? Right? What, is the, what is the sort of BIM use that helps us to achieve the goals that we're looking for in our projects, decreased RFIs? Maybe that's more of a, a visualization thing. Maybe it's more of a, a sharing model content between uh, all parties that are involved um, and sort of increasing that understanding of the project. Uh, better understood scopes. Um, we've seen a lot of success with that. Uh, uh, pretty basic, just color coding the model and, and uh, based on disciplines. Uh, and saying, hey, you're responsible for this work, you're responsible for this work. Um, and we've seen success with that as well. Uh, so the BIM execution planning uh, piece is, is critical to what we do. Um, it's not a static document. Uh, it's something that we uh, approach collaboratively. Uh, we approach it collaboratively with our client, with the consultants, uh, and with all players that are involved on a project. Um, I often get, uh, usually at that, that sort of first BIM kickoff meeting, um, you know, we say, hey, design consultant, you're responsible for submitting the BIM execution plan within, uh, within uh, the first several weeks of, of project kickoff. And there's always some friction there. And uh, when they read the BIM guidelines, they say, man, you know, there's, there's always some friction there as well. Okay, well, what, what's your expectation? What are, you, what are you looking for from us? And, you know, the, uh, I think that's where the goals come in. The goals are very important. The specific BIM uses that we're trying to achieve is very important. And through a dialogue with the consultants, through a dialogue with the, uh, the client agency as well. A lot of the client agencies that we represent, they don't fully understand uh, BIM and fully understand what, what BIM or how BIM is going to impact their project. Um, through that dialogue, uh, we end up with a very good BIM execution plan uh, that talks about how we're going to achieve uh, and what we're going to actually achieve on any given project. Um, so I like to begin with the end in mind. Uh, if we know cost is going to be a factor, we uh, talk about it nice and early. And we talk about how we're going to link a building information model to uh, whether it's uh, to produce quantities or link it to a design estimate or a detailed construction estimate uh, and how that's going to take place. Uh, so here's some, some BIM uses that we've uh, implemented on our projects. Uh, we have site analysis. Uh, in uh, site analysis, in this, this photo, we actually had a, uh, a helicopter who went up in the air on one of our sites and produced a, a LIDAR scan uh, of the actual site. This is where we uh, placed uh, a very large building in this area. Um, that LIDAR scan was shared with the design consultant who produced the point cloud. Uh, that point cloud was imported into Revit, uh, where we uh, use the topography tool to lay out, lay out the site. Um, helped us as the design consultant at the time to actually site and locate the building. Uh, existing conditions. Um, this is another BIM use that we call for. Uh, it doesn't happen on every project that we have. Uh, but we own, a, uh, we own several uh, laser scanners. One of them is a, uh, a Faro scanner. We also have a Leica scanner. Uh, and uh, I have a gentleman who works for me who uh, operates our scanners. Um, and, you know, we're still in the process of, uh, in the process of uh, uh, sort of working out the workflows in, in terms of how we use the scanners to capture existing conditions. Uh, but we're making some progress. Um, this is an actual uh, a image from... Uh, uh, I think the, the application is called Pharaoh Scene. 
uh, or Faro scene web share, um, where we host all of our uh, point clouds uh, in the cloud and we give, uh, we give access to this information to our consultants, uh, to the client agencies as well. Um, we recently went out and surveyed uh, and did building assessments on, uh, I think it was 25 sanitation facilities. And uh, as we were doing the building assessments, we uh, scan all of the rooms that we were in as well. Um, this information we can use uh, for measurement, uh, spatially to understand what space we're in, uh, visually, um, area, uh, et cetera. Uh, here's a, a scan of our city hall. Uh, this is New York City Hall. This information was uh, sent back to our design consultant, uh, and they incorporated that into their building information model. Uh, internally, we're looking at uh, many of the applications that are on the market, some of them better than others. Um, scan to BIM. Uh, there's uh, other applications as well that look to uh, sort of seamlessly convert this point cloud data into actual model objects. Um, we're getting there. Uh, and hopefully those tools and applications will, will sort of progress, hopefully, in the near future. Uh, design authoring, this is pretty typical on all of our projects. Uh, if it's a BIM project, you have to use a BIM authoring application. Um, once again, uh, the largest sort of market share in, in the US and in North America is Autodesk, and uh, these are actual uh, Revit models. Uh, this was the uh, design model, uh, facade, um, the MEP model, three different models combined. Uh, but we modeled uh, all of the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems, as well as the fire alarm system. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and the structural model. And uh, with the intent of producing construction documents. Uh, still today, um, with all of the technology, all of the models that, that we see, all of the models that we share. Um, the paper is still the contracted deliverable. It's in the contract. Um, it's still the contracted deliverable. The model uh, hasn't become the contracted deliverable yet, but it's uh, definitely an asset to the overall team uh, and how we coordinate, how we visualize, uh, and how we come up with these construction documents. Uh, so this is more uh, design authoring, um, actually phase, phase planning. Uh, in this case, let's see. Uh, this was a particular project where uh, the Revit model was uh, exported to Navisworks, uh, and the CM, uh, in this case, um, uh, tied the model to schedule, in turn, helping us, the client, visualize how the project was going to come together over time. Um, this all, all of, all of what I'm showing you, right, with these different BIM uses, they all become more difficult uh, without standards and guidelines uh, in place. Uh, so I was very encouraged to uh, hear this particular organization and, and the efforts that, that they are doing with the uh, with the BIM content. Um, we also had a series of uh, building assessments that uh, I mentioned to you earlier uh, in which we uh, went out and uh, also did some laser scanning. Uh, on these building assessment projects, um, you know, it, was, it was mandated by the city of New York that we visit our projects every four years. Right, so we have to go out to the project site. Every four years, uh, we have a, a team of inspectors. Uh, this was um, uh, the use of BIM 360 field. Uh, and I probably ad hoc the, the use of the application a little bit. Um, we weren't doing, uh, it wasn't new construction. We were not doing, uh, there wasn't site safety involved. There wasn't any commissioning involved. This was. I guess more in lines with retro commissioning, not even, not even retro commissioning the, uh, the buildings. Um, but we had a, a group of architects and engineers who went out with a checklist who had to go assess these sanitation facilities 
uh, and they were capturing information. And it said, man, if you're going out and you're asking all these questions and you're capturing all this information, it would be great if you are, you know, you're the mechanical engineer, you're the plumbing engineer, uh, why don't you jot down the manufacture of that, uh, that unit and that system and how, how much BTUs it has, uh, et cetera. So that's all information we captured. Um, it, it hasn't made its way full circle yet, uh, but uh, I imagine that when we hire a design consultant to uh, actually go out and redesign or do work in that facility, that that's information that we can share with them. Uh, and these were uh, existing, pardon, existing condition photos and actual reports that we, we uh, gave back to our client, as well as a database of, uh, a, database of a lot of information. Uh, coordination. Um, coordination is huge, um, something that uh, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with as, um, as our contractors, um, especially in the uh, MEP world. Uh, but even within the constructs of the design, bid, build framework and, and design, bid, build contracts that, that we uh, use as an agency and as a city, we, we've had success with uh, integrated project offices, right? So maybe not an integrated project delivery uh, tri-party agreement where everyone's signing the same contract and there's uh, benefits to that. Um, getting everyone in the same room is benefits. Uh, and we, we've had some success with that. Um, getting everyone in the same room and coordinating models, um, whether it's for clash detection purposes and producing clash reports and working through those reports on a day-to-day on -day basis, uh, whether it's a design coordination or a construction coordination uh, that's happening. Um, this was a, a recent review uh, that we did of a 75% uh, construction document submission from a client where we coordinated the various models uh, and just pointed out some deficiencies in, in some, of the, uh, some of the design. Uh, some of it was very obvious to the design consultant. Some of it was uh, things that they didn't notice. Um, and some of it were things that they were aware of. Uh, but using the tools to help us, uh, help us move, move the projects along. Uh, <clears throat> Police Academy project. Um, uh, I took this snapshot last week. Uh, but there's approximately 100 days left to completion. Uh, so this project's well into construction. Uh, but on this project, we, uh, we um, used BIM implementation during the design and during the construction phase of the project. Uh, it was one of the first projects where, uh, as a model, we shared the model with the various subs uh, and folks who were actually bidding on the work. And uh, we used uh, these sort of visualizations uh, for scope delineation, right? What is the area of work that you're asking me to bid on uh, and, and helping me to visualize and understand that um, versus looking at two-dimensional drawings? Uh, same here, this was more of a, a QAQC check of the actual model. Uh, and the CM, the CM did this um, to help them actually quantify the model and tie the model to estimate. Uh, but they were pointing out deficiencies, uh, deficiencies in the model or uh, things that actually needed to be resolved within the model, whether it uh, affected the design team, the CM, or general contractors on the project. Uh, this was uh, a representation of uh, some clearance that was needed uh, for a particular, uh, it could have been a, a, a valve, I'm not exactly sure what, what, the, um, what this is, it could be a VAV system, but there was uh, access clearance that was done on all of the models, uh, and the red represents an area that uh, needs to be uh, or needs to maintain its sort of clearance. Mm -hmm. um, this was another uh, review of a uh, fire, fire station that we did. Uh, and in this case, um, we 
took it a little, uh, a little deeper in, in this case um, with the review that we did, uh, where we talked about some of the goals that we were looking to achieve on the project, quantifying the model, uh, coordination, um, uh, the fire department. Uh, this is gonna, gonna be one of the first projects that, that they do uh, where they're actually using uh, or looking to use the building information model um, to uh, help them maintain the asset once we turn over the building to them. Uh, so, you know, we're moving towards that goal, right? A BIM for asset management. Um, and there's some challenges there. You know, we had a lot of challenges in understanding uh, what systems that they were using to maintain and operate their building, what attribute and information was important to them that they needed to, uh, uh, that we needed to generate from the building information model. And we're in the middle of that. Um, helping the design consultant uh, understand how the coordination process was gonna happen, if there was any errant objects on different work sets, um, and, and really scrutinizing the model uh, to make sure that the model was structured in the right way. So we see here we have uh, 440 architectural elements uh, and how those elements are defined. And if the actual elements are, uh, you know, oftentimes, and, and you guys may see this with, with some of the models you encounter, where the architect, uh, uh, this might not be the best example, but uh, let's say they use the uh, uh, handrail for a pipe or something like that, right, where objects aren't necessarily classified the way that they should be. Um, these actually have real life impacts and implications on uh, how we use this information and how it impacts you. Um, more coordination, coordination issues on this particular project. Uh, coordination, uh, we have, uh, and, and th these are all visualizations that we're sharing with our design consultants uh, and sharing with the client and helping to foster further dialogue and further discussion uh, on our projects, uh, benefiting, benefiting the entire team. Uh, we have uh, some errant pipe work in the hallway. I think that's a tripping hazard. Um, and you know, I, I, uh, I wish I, I could zoom in here a little bit, but uh, this is actually the uh, system or a snapshot of the system that the fire department is using to manage their facility. So they have uh, uh, in the system, it's a web-based application. Uh, it has all of the um, attribute data that they're tracking on all of their mechanical equipment, plumbing equipment, uh, et cetera. So they sent us a snapshot of it, and uh, we sort of took that into an Excel spreadsheet and said, all right, these are all the equipment that we have in this new building that we're gonna be handing over to you. This is all of the data that your, your web-based system is, uh, is tracking, is keeping a track of. Um, and here's what we're missing right now in, in our, uh, uh, some of the parameters that we're missing currently in the model. So we've shared this information with the design consultant. We've asked them to uh, make sure that all of, the, uh, um, all of these parameters are, are filled in on the mechanical, me mechanical equipment. Um, so right now, uh, that sort of gives you, gives you a summary of, of the type of work uh, that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we're currently um, revising our BIM guidelines to uh, an updated version. Um, and some of what we're looking to uh, capture in, in the new uh, guidelines um, impacts these, these particular areas here. Uh, design and construction excellence, uh, sustainability, growth, Resiliency has been a big factor, as well as uh, equity uh, for the city of New York. Uh, resiliency um, being related to uh, two very large hurricanes that, that hit the city of New York in the last, uh, what, five, seven years. Um, and uh, having a, a more resilient coast, more resilient buildings. Uh, sustainability, 
is having a big impact on our work as well, uh, where we have uh, some mayoral initiatives to, to decrease energy consumption and energy use over uh, over particular particular time frame. Um, so these uh, these things are all uh, impacting the way we deliver projects, um, and how does that impact BIM? And um, so some particular areas that uh, I'm taking a look at uh, related to the guidelines. Um, we're going to update. <clears throat> uh, we, we already have included in the guidelines uh, level of development. I don't know how familiar you, uh, the audience is with level of development, but we're uh, updating the level of development uh, level of detail specification uh, and the spec that we're using. Uh, and that also helps speak to the various BIM uses that we're looking to achieve on our project. Um, you know, if we have a uh, I'll give a, a brief example. If we have a uh, uh, duct that is at a particular level of detail, uh, duct may not have been the best example. Um, but uh, it, you know, in that regard, you know, if it were uh, two lines versus a actual representation of the duct um, versus the duct having particular attributes um, or some of like the parameters that that we saw in the uh, previous. Uh, the previous um, the previous presenter, uh, how can I use that information? If it was just a 3D representation of the duct, that may be great for coordination. Maybe that's all I need. Uh, but with that attribute information, that may sort of take it to the next level of, uh, level of development uh, for that piece of duct work that I may need um, to help me achieve other BIM uses that I'm looking to achieve. Uh, so this is a rendering, rendering of our police academy project. This was a BIM project uh, that we did. Um, another rendering from our design consultant uh, of the BIM project. Uh, this is actually uh, another rendering, um, but uh, in this case, we, we actually shared the uh, Revit model with the uh, render, and they used that as the basis for. Um, for furthering the rendering, uh, you know they didn't do they didn't. This was a much higher quality render uh, than what we would get in Revit, but it was all about being able to share that information and share that information with the various team members. Uh, so this is sort of a, a snapshot of uh, where we are as an agency. Um, uh, like I said, we we've completed a number of projects. Uh, these are some of the much larger projects that we have um, with a portfolio in excess of uh, $17 uh, billion. Um, and BIM uh, has, has been and, and is uh, an integral part of that. Thank you. And I'll... <laughs> and I'm happy to take uh, some questions if you guys have any questions. No questions. We have a question in the corner. Yes. Do we have a mic for Helen? Thank you. Uh, right at the start, when you're talking about the potential outcomes for BIM and what you were getting from it, one of the points under design was lead, and I was wondering if your BIM systems are integrated with lead. Um, Yes, yes and no, right? And, and the, is that important for us on a project? So first, is the project a lead project? And uh, all of our projects aren't lead projects. Now, if it is a lead project, uh, then it becomes a factor. And how do we, uh, it's always, it's always an interesting topic of conversation with our design consultants when they say, hey, I saw you, know, you have this, sustainability, BIM use outlined, and it says lead, what are you expecting me to do? And you know, with the lead, um, with, the, uh, with the lead certification, uh, there's certain criteria that, that the design consultant have to meet. They have to submit certain documentation. Um, there's, certain, uh, there's certain goals that need to be met. Um, how does that impact our BIM workflow? 
uh, and how is it related to our BIM workflow? Um, so something as simple as uh, you know a shared parameter. You guys are, uh, uh, have been um, talking about shared parameters uh, the previous presentation before me, but maybe there's a shared parameter that tracks the number of lead points for a particular object. Maybe it's a green roof. Maybe it's a uh, could be a, a MEP system. Um, uh, whatever it is that the lead uh, lead is tracking, uh, and how does that impact the overall calculation, and, and does it um, does it have an impact on the actual lead contents that's being submitted to the accreditation agency USGBC in this case? Um, so with that, we we develop a, a sort of uh, plan of how the design consultant is going to track. Uh, the different lead components using the building information model and how that's going to help them sort of support this submission to, uh, to the agency. Any other questions? G'day there. My name's Ladin. Um, just interested in uh, how you deal with interoperability and archiving uh, and just wondering with your open BIM philosophy, it strikes me you might have some massive issues, and uh, have you ever looked at IFC to cover those off? Yeah, so uh, when we came out with the first version of the guidelines uh, in 2012, uh, I did some testing with IFC, and it wasn't what I wanted it to be as yet, right? So I was testing out some various models, and uh, there was literally pieces of the model missing, depending on which software vendor I was using, whether I was using Autodesk or a Bentley model, uh, et cetera. And I think that's changed. Um, this was uh, uh, almost four years ago, five years ago now. Um, and the version two that we're coming out with uh, sometime next year, um, I'm taking a, another closer look at IFC. Uh, we definitely support Open BIM. Um, one of the one of the reasons that it wasn't in the first iteration of the guidelines uh, was as a city of New York, uh, we, um, and, and within our contract and within the BIM guidelines, um, we asked for the native file format that, or from the authoring application. So whether you used Revit or whether you used Bentley or whether you used uh, Archicad, uh, as a design consultant, as a CM, as a GC, we want all of the content in its native format. Uh, so if you gave me a Revit file, if I wanted to uh, then export that to IFC, I had the ability to do that. Um, and uh, likewise, even sharing information amongst the various uh, consultants. Um, we own the information, so give it to us. Uh, there's a, it was always issues of uh, the design consultants sharing their models with uh, the CM and, and GCs, et cetera, and it's like, no, it's ours, give it to us, we'll take it. Um, if we find benefit in sharing uh, this information with uh, the GC or with the CM or with other design consultants, we will do that. And we share all of our, all of our models. Yes? Uh, ben Hawkins from the AMCA. Um, Safi, you spoke about uh, your, uh, the department's objectives being um, really informative in terms of the BIM uses. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if you can expand on that and whether or not um, New York City Council has any sort of principles around you know, environment or energy efficiency or things like that can really drive, say, the, the lead use. Um, yes, yes, there, there are. So uh, there are many... Uh, uh, sustainability goals that I, I think the city of New York looks to achieve as a whole uh, and the city council they enact certain laws um, there's uh, uh, local laws I think local law 87 is one of them local law 83 there's a few of them that impact uh, sustainability goals for the city of New York as a whole uh, so how does that translate into BIM um, so uh, this is where our BIM uses come into play. Um, and everything doesn't necessarily translate to a, a mandate or uh, a specific ruling from council or from legislature. Uh, maybe it's uh, what 
the, uh, what's important on this particular project or what the client is looking to achieve or what DDC is looking to achieve as an agency um, and how the BIM use can, can help us to achieve that. Um, so engineering analysis as a BIM use, uh, we may uh, be looking to uh, explore many different iterations of a facade and we may want to send that information to a specialty consultant who's going to um, you know, do some engineering analysis on that facade uh, and talk, you know, maybe talk about energy improvements on the facade or the design of the facade. Um, we don't really care how you do it and how you achieve it, but we know that's what we're looking to achieve. So you, uh, you may use, uh, you know, you may use your, a pen and pencil or you may use, um, you know, a, a particular application to run an analysis on a facade uh, to see if it, it can help uh, achieve whatever goals we're looking to achieve, the goal of energy reduction, uh, per se. Um, so we don't necessarily uh, care or want to mandate how you do it, but uh, if we're looking to achieve a particular use, um, you have to help us to achieve that use. And, and, and we sort of uh, lay the framework and, and lay that out in the BIM execution plan on all of our projects. Um, just a yes. really quick follow-up question. With Local Law 87, are you required, like, do you require the buildings to publish the results of their energy and water audits, or do you just keep them in the city, and what do you do with them if you don't publish them? Um, that is I, I'm not my area of expertise. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, you, can, you can look up the, uh, the there's a, uh, a new plan for the city of New York. I, I believe it's called, uh, I want to say it's called One, One City, One New York City. Um, I hope the mayor is not watching this, right? Uh, one, one New York City, um, and also the uh, 20, 20 by 50 initiative uh, as well. And it's uh, just a reduction in overall uh, energy consumption for the city of New York by, uh, by a certain time. Um, it's very ambitious, and uh, I don't know if all of this information gets published, if it's available to the public. Um, but, uh, and, you know, BIM is not the integral part of, of that vision, but uh, if it plays a piece in it, um, we're happy to explore how, how BIM, BIM can help. There's a question over here. Thank you. Bilal Sukkar from Change Agents. Um, a question, two questions, actually. One, I happen to have, have a look at your uh, guidelines just a few days mm -hmm. before, so, and I noticed and just checked again that um, you mentioned integrated project delivery. There is a definition for it, mm -hmm. but there's no expansion to it. So maybe you can tell us if you've done any projects using the IPD. Um, no, we haven't. And uh, I um, so we we have. I think there was uh, there was typically 95, maybe more percentage of our projects, design bid build. Right, so a design bid bill framework. Uh, we've done some design assist work, right? Where we uh, uh, we've had some of those contracts in the past. It's not very typical uh, in the way we procure our work, um, and uh, we've also had success on many of our projects where even within the design bid bill framework, um, uh, where we've brought CMs on very early in the process, so maybe in a design development phase um, to, uh, for certain services, even within that design bid build framework. What we have had success with is an integrated, uh, integrated office approach to our work. So even within the design bid build framework, um, getting everyone in the same room as early as possible, uh, we've found success with that. Um, and more specifically, uh, it's outlined in the BIM guidelines uh, to really talk about the development of a BIM execution plan and uh, where if it was a design bid build project, we may end up with uh, two or three BIM execution plans, maybe one for the design portion of the work uh, and a separate one for the construction portion of the work. Whereas in a design assist sort of framework, uh, we may have an expectation for one BIM execution plan throughout the duration of the project that 
uh, the design consultant is going to impact as well as the CM and the GCs that will sort of carry through uh, through the duration of the project. So that was the other intent with, with how so we sort of laid it out. So using the execution plan as quasi-replacement of a contractual mandate for everybody to sit. So using yeah, that as a main document. Not, not, so much a, not so much a replacement, but, but um, uh, I guess the way it works in our contract, the BIM guidelines is referenced in our contract. So it's a, uh, you sign a contract with the city of New York mm -hmm. to do design work, whether you, or, or CM, right? You have certain services outlined in your contract. And uh, as a, uh, I forget if they call it an addendum or an appendix, but an addendum to the contract is DDC's BIM guidelines version X, right? So and you open up that BIM guide, in that BIM guide, it talks about the development of a BIM execution plan within a certain time frame of a project. Uh, that BIM execution plan uh, should encompass everything that the BIM guidelines uh, talks about. And uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's a part of the contractual uh, obligation. Thank you. Uh, second question is, uh, you notice that you, you guys have developed your own BIM guidelines. Mm -hmm. There's many councils and universities and in the U.S. that have developed their own BIM guidelines, mm -hmm. although you have a national BIM guideline uh, So, um, but So my question is... Okay. Do you think that's the best? Like we're struggling with the same question here in Australia. We don't have a mandate. Uh -huh. Is what you guys are doing, large clients, you know, large universities, uh, councils? So yeah. I, I, I want to differentiate between uh, a guideline and a standard. All right, so what we have is guidelines, and that's all it is. It's a guideline or framework to say, this is how we want BIM developed on our project. Uh, I think we are still looking to, uh, whether it's the, the national government, local government, um, or some other organization besides ourselves to actually develop those standards, whether it's a collaboration of, of uh, 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 government or industry, private sector, et cetera. We definitely don't feel we're, uh, uh, that these guidelines are, are the standard, um, but this is what is going to help DDC meet our objectives on our projects. Um, and with that, um, uh, much of what you see in our guidelines, uh, I, I tried as best as I can to sort of keep it in line uh, nationally with the National Institute of Building Sciences uh, national BIM guideline efforts, uh, as well as uh, what many of the uh, other guidelines or, or sort of standards um, that were out there at the time, uh, we're doing. So we don't want to, uh, definitely not the standard producers for the city of New York or uh, nationally for that matter. Thank you. All right. Uh, last question. Hi. Um, do you have any metrics around the benefits that you've received from implementing BIM? Anything on the cost savings or schedule improvements that you might have had? Um, yeah, I mean, good question. Uh, you know, with, with a lot of the uh, metrics, um, I've been relying on uh, have been uh, produced by uh, industry, private sector, uh, et cetera. I, I would say... Uh, you know, being a government agency, our bottom line, uh, we're not looking to make a profit or turn a profit, you know, so it, it hasn't been uh, a sort of pressing need uh, for me or for the agency. Um, but I think overall, uh, we recognize that uh, it's a better approach and it's a better way of, uh, of working, whether it's the collaborative piece whether it's the sharing information uh, more often and early. Um, have we sort of seen measurable uh, uh, things? Yes, we, we've seen, a, you know, on our BIM projects, we, we've seen a reduction in, in design errors, and we've seen a reduction in change orders. Um, but there's so many other factors that impact our projects. Um, you know, whether, it, you know, sometimes the projects are underfunded, sometimes the clients don't. Uh, fully understand what it is that they, they, they want. Uh, so there's so many other factors that sort of impact uh, the overall project life cycle. Um, BIM is just a piece of that, and uh, I think we feel, uh, we feel and, and I think the industry is beginning to recognize 
uh, that BIM is just a better way of delivering a project. So we, we haven't relied uh, as heavily on the metrics as, as one may expect. Thanks. Thank you.